Okay. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Elias Redstone. I'm the Artistic Director of Photo 2022 International Festival of Photography here in Melbourne. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Boomerang and Wurundjeri people of the Kula Nation as the traditional owners of Melbourne and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I'm delighted to be able to introduce this new international season of Photo Live, presented in partnership with Autograph in London. Um, 10 online conversations between artists, photographers and curators from Australia and the UK will explore ideas of identity and belonging in the context of human rights, representation and social justice. And this program highlights the importance of centering Black, Indigenous, feminist, queer and other marginalised voices in storytelling and photography. Photo Live is supported by the British Council and is presented as part of the UK Australia season 2021-22, a collaboration between the British Council and the Australian Government's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. The format for these Photo Live talks is really simple. For each session, an artist from one country is in conversation with a curator from the other country. The conversation will last for about half an hour and then we'll open up for questions. Feel free to leave questions at any time during the, door, during the talk using the Q&A function on the Zoom screen. If you'd like to access captions, please click Close Captions and select Subtitles. Now, for this first session, we are joined by Melbourne-based artists uh, from No and, and Sama Tukan, Deputy Director, Delfina Foundation in London. Fiong's practice is concerned with the interpretation of history, memory and place and how it impacts individual and collective identity of the Vietnamese diaspora. Through archival process rooted in conceptual practice, he seeks to find linkages between culture, politics and oral histories and historic events, which in turn dictates the materiality of his artistic output. Salma is a contemporary art and design curator and cultural strategist. She is deputy director of Delfina Foundation, an interdisciplinary nonprofit dedicated to artistic, ex to artistic exchange through residencies, exhibitions, and public programming. Prior to Delfina Foundation, she was the contemporary Middle East curator of the VA, responsible for the Middle East art and design programming, curator of the Jamil Prize, and co founder of, of the Culture in Crisis series. She works with cultural organizations on strategy and, and is an advisor, a member of the Arab Image Foundation in Beirut and Numu in Guatemala City. So I'm going to disappear and come back later on. But for now, Salma, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Elias. Um, and I just wanted to take this opportunity to also thank Photo Australia and also Autograph for the invitation. Um, as I've said before, I think it's really the, this opportunity to get to know you, Fong, and to, to get to know your work has been really wonderful. And I hope, I hope it's the start of many more conversations and hopefully collaborations as well. Um, I mean, I found in our previous conversation that although your work is, you know, rooted in a very personal site um, in your own sort of family context and own history and heritage, it's um, many of the questions I think that you tackle around displacement, forced exile, um, and the questions around memory resonate on a very deep personal level for me, and I think also collectively. And it feels in a sense like it's this constant renegotiation between past and present. Um, there was some something that you mentioned maybe in our last conversation, a phrase that you captured, I think captured it really beautifully, which was that, you know, this idea that your work is a residue so that it's actually a byproduct of who you are, where you come from, and it and also that it's in flux. So anyway, I'm looking forward to you talking and expanding maybe more on it, but I know that you have a presentation, um, so it would be great to get into it. Hey. Thank you for having me. Um... Can everybody see the screen? That's great. Um, I'd like to firstly begin by acknowledging the people of the uh, Wurrung and Burrung uh, language groups of the East Kulin Nations, upon whose unceded lands I currently reside. Um, I respectfully acknowledge their ancestors, elders, past, present and emerging and extend this to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here with me today, uh, us today. Um, I also like to um, usually ask people to acknowledge if they are on um, stolen land to acknowledge in the chat room um, where they are dialing in from as well. Um, so yeah, I, I thought um, we would start um, our conversation here with um, my favorite photo of 
possibly all time. Um, and this is a, a family photo um, that forms part of the Vietnam Archive project. project. Um, so it's embedded in there in a personal stream. Um, and this is a photo of my maternal family, um, my mum's family uh, in Phnom Penh in, I believe it's 1958. Um, I like to unpack photographs and in doing that understand their story the stories behind it and the stories that have come out of it as well so in this photo i've been able to um, date it because my mum's not actually in it and so um, there's my mum she's been i guess you can call it analog photoshopped in um, uh, by my grandmother sometime um, between 1958 when she was born and 1981 when she fled the country, um, Vietnam. This is in Phnom Penh because I know the family narrative behind that. Um, they were part of a French speaking uh, community there um, that either ran the bureaucracy or worked in French businesses. businesses. And how I know this is um, in 1958 is because my grandmother's pregnant in that um, photo. So the idea that photos tell stories, even though they are static objects that capture a moment and they continue to tell stories even after the fact. A couple of years ago, I noticed that someone um, standing behind my grandma grandfather there was erased from the photo as well. Um, but then how do they connect through lineages and through um, migration, stories of migration and displacement? Here is a Vietnamese community that, uh, relocated during a colonial period uh, to Phnom Penh from South Vietnam. And here's a picture of my parents and my uncle and aunt with my brother, my mother uh, and my dad. My mother's pregnant in a refugee camp um, in 1980. This would have been early 82. Um, my mum here is pregnant with my sister, also in a space where she wasn't born, um, much like her mother was during this colonial period. And it isn't until um, very recently in uh, 19, uh, 2012 that my sister was pregnant with her daughter uh, in Australia, the same country that um, my niece, uh, that she, my niece was born in the same country as her mother. So this narrative of um, displacement um, and, and rupture through um, different forms of either colonialism, imperialism um, is, a, is a through line that travels throughout my whole family. Prior to my grandmother, you know, their parents were Chinese and so they, they migrated at some point a few generations back as well. <clears throat> so I guess that's kind of where I want to framework this, this conversation um, in dialogue with Salma. Um, in this place of, um, questioning of in-betweenness, of displacement, of rupture, of um, trauma um, as a result of different political interferences um, on the lands, lands where we come from. Um, so feel free to jump in anytime <laughs> and ask any questions. Um, so the Vietnam Archive Project grows out of um, this need to collect an archive uh, the imagery uh, and objects of my people and the history behind them. It consists of, at the moment, uh, around 20,000 different slides, photographs, uh, objects, um, documents, um, including one in which uh, it's my mum's birth certificate, which we found a few years ago in the ancestral shrine, um, and realised that her birth date was wrong and we've been celebrating her birth date on the wrong day ever since we were born and she had it wrong. So these, these objects, these archives, they, they can be reinterpreted and, and the idea that they are a static object um, is not something that really correlates with me. Um, when I talk about my practice, I talk about it as rooted in a lens and, and I'll explain that a bit later when we look at other projects that may not necessarily have a photographic outcome, but do have a, a lens within them at some point. Um, so these are examples of some of the images that are held within the Vietnam Archive Project. 
Um, and this is the Vietnam Archive Project with the Work Colony that's been displayed um, at the MCA in Sydney. On the walls, um, one wall has my maternal um, history and the other side has my paternal history. Um, and in, there's a cupboard behind there that belonged to my grandmother that houses, housed the whole uh, of the archive. Um, I, I like to look at the way relationships are formed through objects and through images. Um, the table, for example, in, in this photograph is a table that belonged to my mother's ancestral home um, for a century. Um, and at the end of the war, they were wealthy and well off. And there were three tables, the legend has it, a square table, a round table, and this oval table. And the contents of the house were sold off at the end of the war. Um, and this, this table, um, and all the furniture and, and everything was scattered across kind of this region of Vietnam in order for the family to survive. The reason why I was able to relocate this table was this table was bought by my dad's family prior to my parents meeting or just about that time. Um, so it's, it's, I consider the table a self-portrait. It's the merger of the two families and this history that um, talks about this displacement in a really complex and interesting way. Um, so these are some of the objects and just take note of the objects, the shrine objects, because they reappear and get reworked um, constantly um, in different projects. Well, I think there's something really beautiful around, yep. you know, the, the focus that you have also on this idea of relationality. And for me, you know, when you're talking about, well, throughout actually most of your projects, it really reminds me of something that I learned recently through one of our residents, which was this indigenous philosophy across the African continent called Ubuntu, which, which basically talks about this relationality that a person is a person through that relationship, what they become, the, the sort of essence of what they become is in direct correlation to that relationship that's formed, which I feel really carries through in your work. Yeah, I, I think it's one of those things and I'm, I'm realizing that there are different um, terminologies um, through my community, and I, I use that term expanded through kind of the POC community of artists that I engage with, that there is this idea of, of legacy and ancestry and this kind of bleeding of histories through the understanding of who we are and how we exist in the past, present and future. And I guess that's a really interesting way to kind of put how I like to navigate um, the understandings or, or mirror um, or put in opposition different images or objects that may speak or with each other or against each other to open up um, questions. And, and to me, I guess the idea of questions and, and what the potential answers could be are uh, the most interesting aspects of art making. It's not about trying to find the answers, it's about trying to find those questions that are unanswerable. Um, and and no, and to some degree, I think also part of that unanswerable is also that we're dealing with some aspect of fiction here. I mean, in, in a personal sort of, um, in, in sort of my own personal experience, um, much of my reckoning with, you know, where I come from, which is I'm born to Palestinian parents, really came through the development of a fictional place because it was based on the memories of my parents and the memories of my grandparents so in, in fact it's it was very much formed by what we were surrounded with within our homes you know the photographs of family members and the maps and various other graphs around us that kind of trails and essences of this country and with you know very much the rose tinted glasses it was based heavily on nostalgia to the point where i think when i actually traveled there for the first time my confrontation with the reality of what it had become and what it was now and was was totally um was very jarring you know from this sort of imagined fictional place that perhaps never existed yeah and i totally agree that um nostalgia is dangerous in that it lies to us um and it presents falsehoods that we buy into um yeah, and it's interesting that um I'm currently reading this, which is by Viet Thanh Nguyen, which is Nothing Ever Dies, which is about nostalgia and, and the war and how the war lives on and a whole bunch of other things. But when he talks about the nostalgia for South Vietnam, he's talking about a falsehood um, and, a, and a belief of nationalism that, you know, the, and we, we talked about this briefly last week when I said the, the 
the idea of a South Vietnam, a place that no longer exists as a political state or a nation state, um, the idea of it as a place exists in the minds of the people who aren't on the land where it once stood, um, which is an interesting way of kind of understanding um, how we create these communities within ourselves to uphold these memories and these nostalgias that can be quite dangerous and you know you can draw a direct correlation to white nationalism in in kind of these these moments as well is that it's a nostalgia for a time that never really existed um and and that kind of is a good place to go with kind of this next body of work which looks at um what we value and what we forget um you know, uh, this was a work that was produced directly in response to the burning of Notre Dame Cathedral um, and the outpouring of grief and the, the I think it was 885 million pounds or a million euros that was raised in the subsequent days of it. You know, I was quite shocked by, by this. And um, my, my first instinct was to tell people to go to Saigon because there's, Notre Dame there, you know, go have a look at that one. It's just a smaller scale and made out of red bricks. Um, you know, the, the Notre Dame Cathedral that exists in, in Vietnam, which is the one that's pasted on kind of the glass of the frame here or mounted on it, um, was built to replace a chapel that <clears throat> was built on top of a, an abandoned pagoda during the conquest of Cochin China, which is South Vietnam. Um, by Napoleon the Third, um, you know it, it. It's a. It's a one of those. One of these work. These works are really about putting these images in dialogue to try to unpack why we value certain things and why we don't value other things, and that includes human life. Or, um, you know, there was a great article by Al Jazeera when this happened, talking about all of the the imperial act, imperialist or American kind of military action in the Middle East. Um, or West Asia, and the 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 lack of empathy for the, those situations, which is real human life, in comparison to kind of a monument, I call Notre Dame a monument for colonialism, because in most instances, colonialism is instigated by a civilizing action um, justified through Christianity and Catholicism. Um, so these works try to, to push up against that, that understanding of, of who we are and where we, we've come from and really very much a, an instantaneous response to seeing Vietnamese people on my Instagram feed mourning the loss of, of Notre Dame Cathedral um, when it was on fire in April 2019, I believe it was. Um, that essentially then leads to works like this, which is um about uh louis the 16th and um the first treaty of versailles which not many people know about which happened in the 1700s the late 1700s just before the the french revolution um and it was negotiated between a new win prince um bartering arms and deals with uh louis the 16th and we all know marie antoinette um as the start point of this dialogue between the two countries politically, because prior to this, it was missionaries who were engaged with Vietnam. Um, and then with this, we, we kind of get to images that are, and sorry, trigger warning, um, of po colonial postcards that use images of um, executed political dissidents to export ideas of um, eugenics. Uh, these are people who were executed via machete. Um, the enlightenment wasn't afforded to them, um, but was afforded, you know, and I don't believe in capital punishment, but the argument was that the guillotine was a humane and enlightened way to murder. Whereas, and it was afforded to certain class stratas, but was not afforded to the colonized bodies of North Vietnamese people. Um, it, there was one in South Vietnam, but much like um, much like what happens in a lot of colonial settings, and, and Rwanda is a good example of this, is that a ethnic group is selected as the rightful heirs um, to our place, 
um, and that creates lateral violence that we see and we continue to see in places all over the world. Um, uh, this is Louis XVI um, and his execution in comparison to what they called an execution of a pirate, which was a political dissident. Um, and then finally, kind of currently the series um, closes with this work, which is the, the signing of the, the second Treaty of Versailles, which happened in 1919 at the end of World War I. Um, which, and, and all of the works, by the way, are named after quotes. And this is a quote by Winston Churchill, if you can see there, um, stating that um, to an overwhelming extent, the wishes of all nations were, were met. Um, however, that they omitted colonies or the col colonized um, nations out of this, this treaty. They just went back to their European owners um, at the end of it. So this image, um, contrasts the, the actual table that the Treaty of Versailles was signed in on um, in the Hall of Mirrors um, with the um, the Emperor's throne room in um, Hue in central Vietnam, um, which was by then only the seat of uh, a puppet um, for the French. Um, this work will continue on to explore notions of fine dining and the Michelin company, rubber plantations, slavery, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, it, is, it, it, it is a good way to comprehend histories and a comparative history between two places that were so intertwined, but the decisions were so different and the outcomes were so different for similar, um, you could consider similar political issues like labor. Um, political upheavals, imperialism, and all of these things that come into play. Uh, and human rights, human rights were treated very differently in both spaces. I, I was going to ask if you could say a little bit more. Um, you started telling me a little bit about the, the sort of impact that Michelin had actually, you yep. know, across Vietnam, but as a, um, and obviously how, how its name has now been completely uh, sort of whitewashed with as a sort of sign of excellence in terms of the cuisine industry. Yeah, so Michelin, Michelin is a, I find Michelin quite fascinating because it was one of the largest rubber plantation owners and probably still is really um, in the world. And it was definitely the largest plantation owner in, in Vietnam at the time. And they used a lot of um, coolie labor or um, indentured labor on their plantations. And most of that, most of those laborers came from the North and Central uh, of Vietnam and, and as we know uh, through history, a lot of labor movements lead to nationalist movements that lead to communist movements. Um, so that's kind of one of the reasons, it was one of the, the kind of the pins of kind of the, the Viet Minh and the movements of uh, the nationalist party in, in Vietnam. Um, and we all know how that ended with the massive civil war uh, in the 60s and 70s. Um, what, uh, Michelin company did in Vietnam and a lot of rubber plantation owners did in Vietnam was um, used a form of uh, torture and labor to extract the most out of the human body, um, whether that be um, murdering people and using them as fertilizer um, or keeping them in a form of labor that kept them entrenched in poverty. Um, the Michelin, and I don't know how many people know this, the Michelin star is from the Michelin country, uh, uh, Michelin company, clearly. Um, but it came about because Michelin also created maps and those maps had places to stop and eat and the best places to stop and eat. And that's where kind of the Michelin star comes from. <clears throat> there's a, for me, there's an interesting correlation between the Michelin star and and um, racism and food um, and is exampled in in TV shows. I'm currently writing a chapter of my PhD at the moment all about MasterChef and their definition of fine dining versus street food, um, <clears throat> particularly one episode last year in the Australian version of it actually. Um, and French food is almost considered always fine dining and then kind of Asian foods are considered cheap and easy. No one is uh, 
willing to pay a certain amount for a bun mi, uh, but for a baguette with cream fresh and some smoked salmon, they will pay through the nose for is a good example of that. Um, so for me, um, Michelin, the company is always entrenched in some form of racism to the point where I say the Michelin man is only a pointy hat short of being a clan member. Um, if you look at him, he's all white. Um, I know he's supposed to be a stack of white tires, but he's just missing a, a hood um, to make him the perfect white supremacist. Um, but the, the ways in which colonial labor and, and labor practices and plantation and slavery has kind of fed into this industry of fine dining and elitism um, and white superiority is to me a, a, a legacy. It's not even a byproduct of the time that it was, it's, it's just a legacy of that. Um, once again, tracing, it's that um, ancestry of the company that has resulted in this. Um, does that, is that enough? <laughs> Yeah, that was fascinating. It's made me want to, to read your PhD once it's uh, published. Um, it's yeah, place. it's just a lot of ranting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so moving on, I, I, clearly I'm using a lot of um, colonial postcards um, in the previous work, Lost and Found, um, but they also apply in advising work. So these are um, postcards, colonial postcards of um, Gongai, which is um, women, of uh, Vietnam <clears throat> and they're so unnatural, they're unposed, they're, they're, a, 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 they're, they're a weird ethnographic creation by studio photographers at the turn of the century, um, the, between 18th and 19th century. Um, 20th, 19th and 20th, sorry, I always get that wrong. Um, and they're posed and stylized in such a way. And they've become a key reference point for this work, um, which is called Drunken Swine. Drunken Swine is a work that was made in collaboration with Wafen Quach under our name Slippage. And it, firstly, it, it started with us going to a Vietnamese wedding um, and being really, really judgmental because they didn't have cognac, like super judgmental. <laughs> Um, which was quite funny because neither Wafern or I drink as well. <laughs> as well. <laughs> but we were raised to believe that cognac was the cultural drink. It's the drink that when my, my siblings got married, it, my, my dad bought like 10 cases of it because every table needed to have a bottle, bare minimum. Um, it was the drink that was pulled out when we had ancestral worship. It was the drink that was pulled out. Um, <clears throat> when you had special guests over. So Drunken Swine grew out of a response of trying to understand why we are so obsessed with cognac. And cognac was proliferated by Napoleon III. Napoleon III um, instigated the, the physical occupation of um, South Vietnam first and then the rest of Vietnam and Southeast Asia. Um, and so I was trying to understand our relationship with that through a colonial legacy. So we're looking at um, concepts of um, mimicry um, and hybridity and all that thing, those things through kind of this cultural artifact of, of cognac. Um, the reason why we're dressed as pigs in these photographs is because we're both born in the year of the pig, but also it's, it's a relationship. It's, a, it's, um, it's pulling from George Orwell's Animal Farm as well when Napoleon the pig um, was considered uh, an allegory for Stalin and the whole book is an allegory for communism, which is where we end, um, where Vietnam gets to by the time kind of a full decolonial process has taken place um, where after, where the nationalist movement and then the communist movement grew out in response to um, colonialism. Um, if you pay attention to some of the photos, you'll see some of the shrine objects in them as well, um, as well as some of the books from um, the, the Vietnam archive project. Um, so this is us, um, reformatting and re playing and riffing on this idea of um, the performative ethnographic photograph um, and an oriental an orientalist kind of framework around that of the far east um, 
slippage is called slippage because it's a play on the slippage of identity, but also we we work 50-50 in clay and photography, so and we slip cast a lot. Um, so this is the back of the work. Um, so as you can see, it's a mirrored perspex back on the, the photographs, um, which create the French flag. We served cognac at the opening, and then there's kind of these 19th century French wine tables that hold um, white porcelain, uh, slip cast porcelain bottles of cognac um, that range in all different types of brands. Um, and we use porcelain predominantly because that's also digging further back into kind of the history of Vietnamese occupation, which um, for uh, close to a thousand years, Vietnam was actually occupied by China and a lot of our cultural um, practices come from a Confucius um, philosophy as well, because prior to uh, the occupation of Vietnam by China, um, we were a very matriarchal system rather than a patriarchal one and it switched during those um, close to thousand years of occupation. <coughs> Um, so once again, this is uh, Riff, um, this is Fern and her daughter, uh, also born the year of the pig. So we kind of timed this perfectly, <laughs> um, but playing on the idea of the Madonna and, and child um, and the introduction of Catholicism in Vietnam as um, a tool for colonialism as well. Um, and then our mask on these kind of pipes um, in reference to the execution postcards as well. Um, so when, when I talked earlier about um, this idea of occupying uh, a space and, and the residue, this, this is a, a triptych of um, a, clearly a red cloth, but it was the red cloth that my parents, my mum made to go on the um, Buddha shrine of the first house that they bought uh, on Ghana country, which is Adelaide um, in Australia. Um, and it's looking at the residue of ritual and, and what that looks like. So this, on this piece of fabric, there are scorch marks and indentations from shrine objects and me handling them. And um, if you could smell it for a while, it's not like incense as well. Um, and when they moved out of their, their, that house, I, I took this cloth and put it into the archive as well. Um, but this comes to a, a, a commission project called Dead Objects and Dead Objects looks at ritualistic objects, um, but also the idea that objects, once they enter a collection, cease to exist in the way that they were intended, so they die. Um, they are also, there's a bit of a pun here because they are also objects for the dead, um, being part, um, objects of ancestral worship. Um, the reason why this is colour and sharp is because it is an object I understand and I've lived with and I've existed with and I understand the context of which um, its lived past was. Um, alongside these works are these really blurry analogue photos of the shrine objects that you would have seen in the earlier slide as well. These were objects that were collected from ancestral homes once they ceased being used in them. As a result, I've collected them and I've put them into my archive. And this is really drawing a critique into my process of collecting and hoarding and archiving. These are objects that I don't know, but they're objects that belong to my family and were used for, like, likewise, like the red cloth used for my ancestors, but I don't have a lived experience or a lived memory of them. Mm -hmm. And so by collecting them and putting them into my archive, I'm actually, in effect, using a colonial and Western collecting methodology in acquiring objects and, and destroying them in a sense because they cease to be used for their purpose and they, they're taken out of the context in which they exist. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a really interesting kind of tactic. I'm very interested in how um, practitioners like yourselves are thinking about um, the sort of nuance of care in institutions. And I agree that I think in many ways we can start thinking about museums and institutions as almost cemeteries when objects yep. enter into. It For me, it also kind of brings up an artist um, that we've worked with recently, Gala Por Eskim, um, who has done a lot of work around 
essentially have similar lines of you know what happens to objects you know when they enter collections whose function is still ongoing and many of them and are for example objects that were intended for ritual perhaps not intended to live in perpetuity or for example something like keys to the afterlife the idea of perpetuity and how you handle something like that um i mean in her case she's she's sort of her one of her strategies has really been to think about how you use modern law within that. So is there a way to think about the spiritual rights of these objects? And so how might you, for example, in one case, she looks at trying to litigate on behalf of the Mayan rain god, you know, to actually restitute some of these objects. Yep. But it, it does, it, I think it raises a lot of interesting, you know, considerations that institutions, um, whether whether they sort of take that into consideration, but it's a sort of nuance of care and what happens, how the, the sort of transformation process when an object actually enters an institution. Yeah, um, and I, I think it's interesting that you use the word morgue because that's how I describe galleries. <laughs> um, I, I often say that when my works go into to gallery spaces, they are on life support and sometimes they come out dead. Um, Sometimes they get remixed or rebirthed into something else, but usually by the point that they get into the gallery, that's kind of an end point that I enjoy the least, I think. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting conundrum to put myself in, particularly um, that these objects are objects that I can still activate within the context of my own life. Um, but I'm, I'm yet to work out what do, doing that means because they are objects I have been collected from. Um, others in my family and and what does like is it just performative to do that is is the next question yeah. I guess um, which I haven't quite worked out I just wanted to sorry to interrupt I just I'm um, just noting the time and I just wanted to see whether um, anyone in the audience has any comments or questions just so we have enough time to for you to address that um, does anyone have any questions for Fong? Otherwise, um, I think we're we would be happy to continue as well. But maybe I'll 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 just see whether anything comes up. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not for now. I I was um I was going to ask on on this kind of note of um sort of the, the use of collections and the use of um within institutions perhaps if we could also discuss um the bullhorn project which i know yeah. is, is kind of cool. behind you i well. can um, it's behind me right now and a bit further on in the slides um i can skip forward if that's um easier. i had because i had a question around that in, in yeah. thinking of like the mechanisms and tools of yeah. categorization and classification i was curious as to knowing obviously the you know the the you know the colonial background um and sort of flattening implied and obviously the non-neutrality implied in classification and categorization and collections documentation just to understand a little bit more um on the decisions um you know to inscribe and to uh to make a record in the way that you have in the sort of museological way yeah so um just a quick summary the bullhorn cake research center um, is a collection of bullhorn cakes um, and they've been collected from bakeries all over currently in Melbourne and Sydney where the two places where I've been able to do it um, and thank god I did it before this messy lockdown happened um, but it's an ethnographic I guess portrait of the Vietnamese diasporic uh, diaspora through bakeries um, and looking at the colonial uh, the colonial uh, legacy and how it's been used to grow the diaspora um, and to create businesses and support the diaspora. Um, for those who are not aware, bullhorn cake is a croissant. Alternative name is the croissant. Um, and the idea is that um, it's, it's a, a collection that um, should be publicly available like a research center a proper research search center but you know funding issues um and uh attached to each one is uh, what i call a bhc number which is a bullhorn cake number which is an arbitrary number that does it that's designated to each item um as well as notes the address where it's come from and it's um the bakery name that it's come from 
Um, so in addition to this, um, each of them will eventually be documented um, and a database created, um, fullhorncake.org, I think it is at the moment. Um, I haven't built it yet, so don't look it up. Um, and through this, you'll be able to look at images of them, see maps of where they've come from, um, and as well as uh, the ways in which they're collected and documentation um, into uh, the preservation process. Um, so each one is actually preserved using varnish um, and hopefully they don't go off because they're let to go stale. Um, so it's, it's a work that really uh, also expands on this idea of colonial collecting um, and how museums hoard uh, ethnographic objects um, in their collection and most of the time they don't get shown. Um, I think if you look at the statistics of any museum, it's like some ridiculously low number of items from the collection ever get um, shown. And I'm finding more and more if you go into these institutions and you request an item, you're pointed to the digital uh, version of it rather than the item itself. And that limits um, understanding materiality um, and the tactility of objects. Um, so it's, it's a broader critique on the ways in which um, museums, the history of collecting and ethnographic collecting um, in kind of uh, Western colonial frameworks. So like the British Museum um, and their inability to deconcession things. Um, there's, there's also going to be a component of this project where it will be um, examining forms of soft diplomacy as well. Um, there's a giant spreadsheet of them and there's uh, an extra panel uh, on that spreadsheet for gifting as well. So the idea that they can be gifted to um, institutions as a form of soft diplomacy to critique the ways in which art and artifacts from particular countries are traded in diplomatic ways. Um, so if you go to like, uh, if two people have a meeting or two world leaders have a meeting at G8 or something like that, usually a dif diplomatic gift is exchanged. Um, and it's something that is cult cult culturally significant to that country. So I've, I've it intentionally, hopefully we'll get to the point where they can be exchanged on kind of a pseudo diplomatic way um, with other collecting institutions as well. Um, for example, uh, I've given one to my friend James, who has the uh, Nguyen collection of Anglo-Australian art, which is a Vietnamese person collecting Australian colonial artifacts <laughs> as a project. So those, those things are quite interesting to me as well in unpacking and understanding power. As, as, a, as a quick question, are you putting, would you put any conditions on the gift? I don't know. I, I need to do a bit more research into understanding how um, soft diplomacy works in the framework of, of um, cultural giving um, or cultural exchange uh, in that kind of echelon of, of power. Um, I know that Taryn Simon's done a really interesting work about um, floral arrangements um, at the UN uh, upon the signing of treaties and things like that. Um, and how they're designed and, and considered. And I think I, I really appreciate her, her level of research and her practice, um, but it's something that I haven't really quite looked in yet because as you can see behind me, this is only half of them, by the way, <laughs> that there's a, I think there's 180 at the moment um, with the, and it will continually expand. And it's one of those projects that can, the next question is it can go anywhere where the diaspora exists and but then what happens when I when or if I do this project in Vietnam where it isn't that colonial artifact isn't displaced through that rupture of war and displacement it's actually in the place that was colonized what does that mean is, is the next question I think if I do that in Vietnam and I'm yet to kind of work that out um, but a lot of my projects span multiple years um, and, and in really complex ways. The Viet Archive project is um, 11 years this year um, and this one feels like it's going to be one that will go for 
a while a while yet and then some of my projects are just a one-off project but it's taken five years to get there yeah okay. I'm, uh, i absolutely love this project and i'm really looking forward to seeing how it resolves itself um unfortunately i'm back on because we're running out of time and i'm gonna have to bring this to a close um it just leaves me to really thank you both sam and Fung, for this conversation i think it's given us all a lot to think about and it's a great way to kick off this series um, we will be back in just 15 minutes with uh, British artist Opie Laurie, whose work is currently being featured in the autograph exhibition Care, Contagion, Community, Self and Other, who will be in conversation with Sean uh, Lakin, the head curator of international art at the National Gallery of Australia. So um, for now, thank you both so much and um, look forward to seeing how this project and your other work develops in the future. Thank you. No worries. Thank you Thank for having you. me. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.